Hi everyone, I'm Michelle and I'm going to be doing exam question 23 to talk about the modularity of mind and all of its components. So first the modularity of mind, I want to talk about how the mind is functionally divided into specialized modules, which is a concept described by Jerry Fodor. To the right we have an image of a Swiss Army knife and in class we did the Swiss Army knife analogy. So I just want to reiterate how the Swiss Army knife has multiple tools that have different functions such as scissors, a knife, a nail file that all contribute to the whole function of the knife. Um, the brain is actually set up in a similar way or as is the modularity of mind theory of it. And so we can refer to how our brain works to, similarly to this analogy of the army knife. Um, and then Jerry Fodor describes non-modular processes and modular processes. Um, non-modular processes are high level open-ended um, and involve wide range of information, whereas modular processes operate at a much lower level to provide rapid solutions to highly determinate problems. So four characteristics of modular processes are domain specificity, where they're highly specialized, informational encapsulation, where uh, modular processing is not affected by what is going on elsewhere in the mind, mandatory application, so cognitive modules respond automatically to stimuli. Um, for example, if we're looking at a visual illusion, we know that we see an illusion after we you know, look at it for a while, but, um, but we still perceive an illusion. The illusion does not go away. We still perceive it, but we know that we're still looking at an illusion. And then speed, um, modular processing transforms input um, from input into output very quickly and efficiently. So um, our photoreceptors in our retina will take 2D images and um, show them in 3D so that we're able to perceive the world we're living in. Fodor's modularity thesis talks about how cognitive modules form the first layer of cognitive processing. So in the image on the right, we can actually talk about these um, multiple bullet points of color perception, shape analysis, facial relations. All of these work together in order to contribute to the big perception of seeing the world the way we see it and interpreting it through information processing. Um, and then that will lead us to contrast to central processing. So central processing is one Kinean and two isotropic. One being Kinean is that each organism's belief system is um, analogous to the scientific theory. So it is the organism's theory of the world that shares important properties with scientific theories. And then two, it's isotropic, meaning that it's not informationally encapsulated. So any part of the belief system is relevant to confirming or disconfirming any other. We can't draw boundaries within the belief system and hope to contain the process of the discom disconfirmation within the boundaries that we've created. <laughs> And then the massive modularity hypothesis. So briefly, I just want to say that the human mind is a collection of specialized modules, each of which evolved to solve a very specific set of problems that were confronted by our early ancestors. And we can call these Darwinian modules. Darwinian modules were studied through um, the Wasson selection task, for example, which was a small case study um, where you are given a condition. So whether each of the four cards below, um, if one side had a vowel, the other side had to have an even number. Um, and that was the rule that you were given. So the first two cards, it's pretty obvious, but with the third card, number four, it's a little difficult to discern. Like there could be a consonant on the other side because having a card with a consonant and an even number hasn't been disconfirmed by the rule. So ultimately, these types of tasks will involve some degree of error, but there are real world ways of framing this task to diminish the degree of error. And then lastly, I want to talk about the arguments in support of this hypothesis. So the argument from error starts from the basic fact that what natural selection selects for are heritable traits that preserve fitness. Um, and they are, according to Cosmides and Tubi, they are to be domain specific. And then the argument from statistics and learning focuses on problems and how domain general cognitive systems can discover what fitness consists in. So um, evolutionarily, fitness promoting actions are the ones that are spread by the genes of the um, agent. And so this equation below actually talks about the concept of self-sacrifice and evolution. So the X subscript refers to the self-sacrificer and the Y refers to the benefit of it. And the term RXY measures the relationship between the two. And then the term CX measures the cost of the kin selection to X, while BY measures the reproductive benefit to Y. So what this means essentially is that the kin selection equation says that kin selection genes will spread when the benefit to the recipient of the sacrifice is discounted by the degree of relatedness to the sacrificer. So it exceeds the reproductive costs of the self-sacrificer. So in total, this kin selection equation promotes massive modularity in a way that in a way that explains how kin selection can get embedded into a population um, in order to understand 
the fitness and the fitness relationships between certain species throughout evolution and natural selection. Um, that is all I have. Thank you all for listening. Um, I'll see you guys another time.